with your devices. <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, I don't have any papers or anything to throw away. I usually bring some, and then I throw them on the ground because I don't read them anyway. So, and then I ramble for a while, and then I'm done. But uh, really, I'm here today. Uh, first of all, thank you for being here. And thank you for uh, supporting, even just being interested in this idea, which we've been trying to get off the ground for two and a half years. It's kind of amazing that it would take two and a half years to get to this point. And uh, there's a reason for it. It's an interesting reason. Because uh, rescuing an art form is not something that really is a, of a high consideration to too many of people in the investment community. Um, and as you know from being music lovers, which I, I imagine most of you are, then uh, uh, there is a need for something to happen. And we've been listening to, since like 1982 or something, when we started making CDs for y'all to listen to, uh, you know, that, that, that started, and then somewhere when the dot-com thing came along, we started using the MP3s. And, and uh, I thought the CDs were a little rocky when they came out, um, because I thought I couldn't hear the echo like I could on the old records and on the analog tapes. And you know, but I'm a musician. I figured, well, I'll just put more echo on. <laughs> and then I, you know, so that's when we started knowing something was funky, because we put more echo on the records than we normally would so that we could hear it when we got the record. Now, that was an indicator of something. And I didn't really understand what it was, but I, it registered on me and I, I talked to people about it and I started to, you know, I guess you could use a number of words, maybe complain or bitch and moan or, you know, about that. But I just really noticed it and talked about it for a while and, and uh, then, you know, we put out a lot of records, and I, I was making records, uh, a lot of records, during that period of time. And uh, in the studio, I noticed that, you know, we had the new digital machines and everything. We had 16-bit 44-1 machines at that time that uh, one of the big companies made. And uh, since I'm going to trash the machine, I don't want to mention their name. I want to be nice. <laughs> but it was a good machine. It was really big, and I had two of them, so I had a total of 48 tracks, and we locked them together. And, and wow, we had a lot of control over the sound, and we could move the sound around, and we could do all kinds of things that we could never do with analog, and it was pretty impressive how we could fix all our mistakes and, and do all of that you know, with these two giant machines. And this was like in the early, I guess in the early 80s. And, and then um, I, I'm a fan of listening loud. I love to listen loud. And, and uh, you know, that's what it's all about, really, for me. I love to hear rock and roll really loud, and I love to hear even acoustic music really loud. Uh, loud for whatever it is it's, it's being played on. So I like to take whatever it is to the limit and then listen to it right there. So when I started doing that with these machines, it started to hurt. And I couldn't do it for very long. So the part of the record making experience that I used to enjoy became painful. And that was a sign to me that something was wrong again. And I, 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 I complained a little, and I might have bitched and moaned a little about that too. But uh, then time went by, and I got some better machines. But they weren't really that much better. It didn't change it. Then I noticed when I listened to CDs in my car, the same thing happened. It hurt my ears a little bit. And then the MP3 came along. And uh, that's when the recording industry really went into duress. That's when all of the artists in the studios, and that's when all of the engineers and all of the people who work behind the scenes to make records for years and years who love music, and all of the arrangers and all of the musicians who came in to play on these giant tracks by great producers and arrangers like Jack Nietzsche and Phil Spector and all those people that used these huge orchestras and played live with you know 12 tambourines and two pianos and multiple instruments and everything, making these great records like 
uh, you know, from the 60s and from the late 50s. And th those people were still in the studios in Los Angeles playing, and, and they were having a great, uh, great experience doing that. But all of those musicians and all of those services that used to support the musicians and all of the recording studios, they started to, to die. Everything started to die. It was the most amazing thing. This vibrant, creative, kind of whole culture started to go away. And it was because of the MP3 and the cheapening of the quality to a point where it was practically unrecognizable. And uh, the price also went down. And then record companies' control of what they could do with the records went away. They couldn't no longer decide how to market the records because they made some stupid deals. They made some very dumb deals with some very smart people. And then, as a result of those deals, they were convinced that they could sell only individual tracks or albums or whatever, but the album had no value. Only the individual tracks had value. So these MP3 tracks were what it was that was happening. That the reason be behind the LPs going away was one of the reasons you might have heard a lot when they first started to lose their, uh, their kind of vibe and their, their reason for being was that, well, it's all just filler. Filler, it's just part of a, you know, the artists are really ripping you off, the record companies, they really put like one or two good songs on, the rest of it's just crap. So you don't have to buy this. If you buy an MP3, all you get is your favorite song. You don't have to get the rest, okay? So, as a guy who had been making records for many years already, even at that point, I was pissed off about that because, because I love making records. That's what I do. I, I, I love every song on the record. I love every note on every song on every record. Uh, they, 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 they meant something to me. They're a family of songs that were telling a story of how I was feeling. And they weren't uh, just filler. So, and I'm not the only one who feels this way. I'm not the only one who, who had these feelings. Now, maybe there were some people who, who did do what they were accused of doing there, but I didn't know them. I had never met those people who said, well, we're going to go in and do eight pieces of crap and two great records. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, if they were doing it, they weren't loud about it. But they were very cool about it. So it didn't seem obvious to me. So, so there we were. Then the guys, you know, the, 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 the gold star where, where Jack Nietzsche used to write those great charts. And, and Phil Spector, you know, for whatever good or bad has happened to him and how he's done in the world, was a genius. And he was making unbelievable records. Sometimes art is, uh, you know, on a different plane from everything else. So here's a genius guy making great records. They're based on Echo. The Gold Star Echo Chamber was a meat locker. And it, it, nobody could figure out why it's so magic. And why, when you turned it on, your records were great. And I went in there with Buffalo Springfield in 1966, and we made our first record. We had, we had producers that didn't know what they were doing. They were making their first record, too. So it was kind of a disaster. <laughs> but I do remember hearing the echo going, my god, it's magic. It really is. You just put your voice in there, and it suddenly, it's, a, it's like in heaven or something. So, so when echo went away, that wasn't just, oh, echo's gone. That was like a world-class disaster. You know, it was huge for the people who cared about sound. And then because all of that happened, Gold Star closed its doors and sold the meat locker. They sold everything, and that was the end of an era. And, and then all their producers and arrangers and musicians and answering services and delivery services for, for the instruments that used to move around town in little vans, going from one studio to another, delivering the musicians' instruments to different sessions, they all started to go away. They all started to die. Now, music is not real estate. It doesn't go up and down that way. So there was really something wrong. And what it was is that we were selling shit. 
people were, you know, still buying it because they liked music. They, they, they were buying wallpaper. They were buying background sounds. They, they were buying Xeroxes of, of the Mona Lisa. They, they were buying a musical history uh, that's supposed to be preserved for everybody to hear, now preserved as a tiny little piece of crap, less than 5% of the data of the highest resolution in digital that we can record in today, which I like to use. So 5% became the standard of the world. And motion pictures went to the digital age, and motion pictures were going up, and pictures were great, even though I still like Gone with the Wind, and I like the way it looks in the original. I like the Kodachrome and all the, you know, all the Technicolor, whatever that was. I love the way it looked. But I could see this digital, you know, stuff was great. The Star Wars and all this stuff happening. It was beautiful. And so those art forms, they went up. A lot of things happened and got better. Everything, you know, cameras, uh, you know, got easier to use. Everything went up. Everything went up. And music went down. Music went to the bottom, and all these people lost their jobs. That's the true disaster of this. Is all of these friends that I had, and all these people that I never met, who I loved anyway, because they were engineers, producers, maintenance men. Uh, all the people who supported our industry all lost their jobs. It's, it's not a bad thing that people make records at home. That's cool. But there is another way to make records, and uh, so that went away. So that was collateral damage of the MP3. Now, I started thinking about that after 10 more years of doing this, not being able to listen to my records. We make records and we put them out. And uh, I go, well, I heard it. It's too bad nobody else is going to get to hear it, unless I put out some vinyl. And they might, then they can hear it. We made vinyl and kept doing that. And vinyl became popular, kind of a little niche. And then, well, oh, wow, well, vinyl's popular. It's starting to get popular. So then, in desperation, record companies started making vinyl based on digital, digital 44-1 files or something, CD masters on vinyl, because vinyl, they thought, was like a collectible. It wasn't because of the sound they were putting it out. They were putting it out because it sold. So they put it out, and vinyl was kind of a sham. But some of it, if you read about it, you could see AAA on it. That meant analog, 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 all the way through the chain. It was analog, and you really got the, what the old vinyl was. But So a lot of times you were just buying a, kind of like a collectible kind of fashion statement. You know, you got the cover and the big deal there, and that was cool, you know, it was nice. Something was happening. Uh, so that's just a little background. And, uh, you know, from my life and where I'm coming from, a little bit of, of uh, background to think about all those people who don't have jobs and all that music that's out there that was created during that time that is now circulated at 5% of what it's capable of being circulated at. And children today, young people growing up, who have, you know, their, their bodies are wide awake and they're, they're sensitive and they can hear, they get something that just lets them recognize it. They can identify the name of the song and learn the melody from listening to this. But inside their soul, they, they're just not getting what we got because there's just nothing there for them. The human body is so sensitive, it's a beautiful thing. A, you know, whatever you believe about where things come from. The human body is unbelievable. It's so sensitive. And, you know, when you, when you, when you give it something, it, it loves it. You give it good food, it, 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 it grows, it's nourished. And when you give it good input, it's, it loves it. And when, you, when it sees great art, it feels good. And we all are like that. So with our music, we were deprived and we started getting very little, a, a, a minuscule one twentieth of what we were capable of getting, what we used to listen to. So then one or two listenings, you'd heard it. Your body was not getting anything new after that. You've already figured it out. That's it. Okay, I recognize it. 
It's, and music even changed a little bit and got cool. Instead of being soulful, which it still is, and, I, and I, I love a lot of artists today, I'm not putting them down, I'm just saying music adapted. It became beat heavy and it became, it became right for what the media was that was selling it. It became smart, it became clever, tricky, a lot of impressive things. And, and the soul was still there. But for people like me, it was like, whoa, you know, I don't want to do that because I'll just be some old guy doing that. I'd rather do what I do. I'd rather do whatever I feel like doing, actually. So, <laughs> if I want to do that, I will. I don't know who these guys are, but I'm having one of their waters. <laughs> we all have to drink. So, so here we are. I started thinking it might be a good idea to try to do something about it. And I know it existed. And I've seen the formats, the CDs, the MP3s, vinyl, cassettes, eight tracks, DVDA, an early attempt at something. It was ruined by somebody who decided five speakers in a living room was going to be fine with the missus. <laughs> Some fool who thought that was cool. <laughs> oh, it's furniture, dear. <laughs> no, no, that didn't work. It had a shot, but it didn't make it. So that was one that had a shot that didn't make it. Somebody tried something. That was nice. That was good. So, so you know, here we are. And uh, you're all listening to a lot of MP3s, probably. They're very convenient. And so what we decided to do was to come out with a new system that was not a format, had no rules, respected the art, respected what the artist was trying to do, and did everything that it could to give you what the artist gave so that you get the feel not just what the artist intended you to feel, but actually what the artist did. And that is what Pono is. Pono plays back whatever the artist decided to do or the artist's producer decided to do. All of the formats, 44.1, 48, 88.2, 96, 176, 192, all of them are all played back on Pono, just like the artist made them. The artist makes the decision. Before the artist had decided to put something on a certain resolution level, and then it'd have to come out on a CD and get dummied down to a CD. That's what happened, no matter what the artist did. So artists started going, well, why the hell should I do that? It's going to go down anyway. But still, some artists continue to record at the higher resolutions, thinking that someday maybe something would be OK. Someday they would have a chance for people to hear them. And so we, we started doing that. I, I moved up to 192, and uh, I've heard about 384. Uh, I've never heard it. Uh, some scientists say 192 is ridiculous. You can't hear it. It has too much information. It's going too fast. People can't hear it. And some producers say you can't hear it. It's a waste of time. So we record at 96. And a lot of records are made at 96. Those are considered high resolution. And they are high resolution. But there is a higher resolution. And you can hear it. A lot of my friends hear it very well. And yeah, it is going really fast. And there are a lot of screw ups. Sometimes it doesn't get there, there are mistakes, there's artifacts. But the damn thing is going so fast you can't tell. There's so much information coming at you that you don't care about a little few things that get missed. So that's how I feel when I listen to it. I'm getting, my body's getting washed. I'm getting hit with something great. 
I'm not getting a bunch of ice cubes thrown at me. It's water, okay? It's happening, it's, it's a cool mist. I'm getting, every part of my body is getting hit with this thing. My soul is feeling it. I'm doing what I used to do. I'm listening, I'm feeling, and I'm experiencing it. I'm living the music. So that's why I recorded 192. And that's why I transferred everything I did in analog to 192. So that I could, so I could have 192 and bring it to you eventually. And then we developed with a great team of people a system to bring this to you. And the system is like, just like iTunes. And uh, the only difference is that the, the resolutions are all higher. If the record company and the artists decided to do that, there was a period of time when the value of that was unclear. So some artists did, some artists didn't. But what Pono will do is it'll bring you the reality and let you understand what the artists have done in the studio. What decisions they made, they'll have to live with. Because once you record at a level, well, if you can double it, but it's not gonna sound any better. It's just a higher number. It really is what it is. It's twice everything, or three times, four times, whatever. Not three. Um, so, so that's what we did. We built this thing. And we made a like an iTunes store for it, which we're doing right now. It's like, it looks the same way. You get it, you download it into your desktop, and you plug it into your Pono player, which there's some pictures of those around somewhere. And uh, we'll show them to you. And, um, you know, the thing is a weird shape. It can sit on your desktop. It can, it can sit on your desk and it can sit there with your stereo system and plug into your stereo system and make it, you know, really sound like God. It'll give you everything that you're, you know, all those big things that you had to give away or put in the garage, they can come back now. <laughs> All those stereo stores that had to close because there's no reason for big speakers anymore because people listen out of little things that look like lozenges <laughs> <laughs> because those are the new sound how cool they can be you can put it right on your kitchen table next to the toaster <laughs> and it sounds exactly like an mp3 and now you can go and maybe those stores will start to open up again. Maybe companies like Macintosh and other great companies that make great audio will be able to build big speakers and do their thing again when this comes out, if it's a success. Now if it's a success or if it isn't a success, music wins because it's available. There's a choice. It's freedom of choice. This is America, this is freedom of choice. I'm running for president. <laughs> jokes I'm going to tell them. So th that's it. It's there. It's Pono. We, we made it. And it's on Kickstarter right now. I don't know if you know what Kickstarter is. If you don't, kickstarter.com. Look for Pono. It's on the front page. It's right there right now. If you want to buy into it, if you want to become part of this uh, revolution and try to save and rescue an art form for the future so that the uh, Art of the past can be captured in something that you can play for your children tomorrow, so that everything that's done today in the studios by budding young artists everywhere that are so great and so talented, and geniuses walking around on the streets of Austin right now can go into the studio and create something and take it to the limit. They can take it to the technological limit that they can afford or their producer can let them do or their equipment allows them to and know that when you buy that product from Pono, that you will get exactly what they made. We do nothing. There's no magic. The magic is done by the musicians and the artists and the producers. That is the magic. All this is, is something to give it to you. 
I like the musicians and artists and producers part because they really are the ones who create it. So we, you know, I really do. And, and I think letting their, letting their art breathe is, it's a great feeling. So some of my friends had some things to say about Pono and, and I'd like to show you that now and then uh, I'll come out with, uh, with Mike and, uh, and we'll, uh, he'll ask me a couple of questions and maybe interrogate me a little bit and I'll try not to get too antsy. Because so far I've been in total control. So I'm a freak, okay? Control freak. So please, you know, roll the video, enjoy it, and I'll, I'll be back in a few minutes with Mike. music I've ever heard. This is what music is. It's supposed to sound like and feel like. That music made me feel good. Much better than I felt in a long time listening to music. Yeah, well, I got my drug of choice. It's, uh, yeah. it's now open. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable to hear the difference side by side. It's uh, it, you really you really forget listening to your iPod how amazing the music can be. Really fantastic. This gives it to you as good as you can get it. This <laughs> <laughs> world is a little different formats in iTunes and uh, high resolution and CD, and then Pono. Say that right, Pono. Uh, it was a very striking uh, comparison. Uh, it's very obvious to, to even my ears. There's no doubt between MP3 and 192 that there's uh, a huge leap in information on, 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 on paper and a huge leap in when you switch from 192 to CD, you're like, whoa! <laughs> so it's just like, wow, it's still the way. Yeah, you listen to the CD, it's like listening to someone twinging on a fucking rubber band compared to, you know, <laughs> the full scope of what music is. It's true. The CD quality and MP3 quality are all, or under all. Yeah. It's, it's, it's simply not, uh, it's, it, it doesn't, it, it doesn't give us back what we, what we put down. When you listen to, uh, like the CD version or the MP3 version, um, it's that, it's gone through those changes. It's sort of lost that original intention. For the convenience and the portability of an MP3, oh, they're great. But it's a, a little bit like seeing a, a, a Xerox for a long reason. The sound has just gotten so bad and people don't care about that anymore. And drums don't even sound like drums anymore. And this sounds like basically like you have a record player in your car. I listen to mine a lot, and I think this is the only other time I've heard a digital experience that equals that or goes beyond that. It's starting to sound like a really amazing, warm, dynamic uh, analog recording. That blew me away from being in a recording studio. It was like you were listening to Bob Dylan, you could hear him playing harmonica right next to you. You could hear the drums and the backing vocals on Respect by Aretha. I haven't heard a sound like that since vinyl. Um, and it's so impressive and it's so brilliant to hear. What he's done is he's developed something that creates a very warm analog sound that takes even your digital records and a certain sort of bottom, a certain sort of loop, but more than anything else, a closeness, an intimacy that digital recording can lose very easily. The, the difference is so, so easy to hear. Everybody should check the sound. The clarity and the warmth and the vitality of it, it really tells a difference. It really tells a difference. It's like, a, like I don't know, curved and round and, and, there's, and there's a dynamic. It doesn't just, doesn't seem like it hits a wall. Like the sound and the feeling and the energy of it was so richer and fuller and warmer and fatter and yummier. The eyes are like butter. Place. You feel like you can just walk around all the sounds 
like in a forest of trees. You walk around all the trees, like the drums over here, the keyboards over here. This is unbelievable because it's all there. You're right in the middle of this amazing thing, and still you hear details. It's just I, I don't know how that happens, but that's what it is. You hear the the reverb from the piano and the guitars and everything ringing out like a sound I'd never heard in a song before. It was awesome. The sound, you know, is just so, so warm, so human. To hear a song in a deeper way, it's more moving, it's more emotional, it seems to touch your soul more. And it just sounded uh, more analog, less sort of deteriorated. She felt it more in her bum, which was a good thing. <laughs> the ability for people at home to hear music again, the way it really sounds, like we heard on records, is a very big deal. This is the moment now where, where people can begin to pay attention to quality again. It's not just like something for hi-fi buffs to hear the top of the hi-hat, it's the vibe. It's the feel of the music gets dramatically altered. Somebody like Neil who cares enough about music and you know get it in its purest form is going to bring that and give people the opportunity to hear what we're hearing in the studio. You know, whatever year it was that comes off the tape, right to your ears, it's organic as it gets. All this technology is to get out of the way of the original experience. So if that's the deal, like if that had made me feel emotional in that situation, imagine something I'd carry in my pocket where I could just like dive and like really hear the music. The best sound quality you can imagine. How it's supposed to be listened to. It's incredible. It's amazing the way music should be heard. It's very clever. Just sat in the future for two minutes at Bonnaroo. It was pretty wild. It's a vehicle to the future. Bono <laughs> is about the music, it's about the people who make the music and the way it sounds to us when we're in the studio making it. It's about you hearing what we hear. And that hasn't happened in a long time. We wanted you to be part of this and to help us to launch this music system into the world. It's a music ecosystem. We think that uh, as music lovers, having you along with us from the very beginning with the special players that we're offering will be uh, a cool thing for you to be part of and for us to be part of with you. So what is underwater listening all about? When you're on the bottom of the ocean and you have a huge tank <laughs> over your, on your back and you know, a big glass ball over your head, that's kind of... You know, you're walking around in a murk and there's big fish down there. That's kind of like listening to an MP3. And when, you, when you're listening to a CD, you've risen to, you know, maybe a couple of hundred feet below the surface, something like that. And you're still underwater. You're, you're not quite in the air. But when you make it to 192, you actually break through the surface and you're breathing air. And the feeling is different actually is a visceral relief. You feel good. Your body feels good. <laughs> Investigation in the sound. Yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And how it's supposed to be heard. Yeah, yeah. very telling. Almost angry. In you fact, can, yeah, you can hear uh, what the MP3 does physically. Yeah, yeah the, the visceral, how it's destroying the sound of music. Yeah. I mean, there's a way that it hits you aesthetically, but then there's also a way it hits you mm -hmm. physically and you can feel the difference. Yeah, yeah there's a narrowness. But it's not flat. Yeah. And the yeah. CDs as well, compared to what we just heard. The yeah. CDs are small. But it's like hearing a different song. Yeah. I mean, you're not hearing the same song. The thing that amazes me is the, the as the Joe, touching what Joey is saying, is the, the width of the stereo field. That was a, a real surprising difference, how wide the stereo image was. And then uh, the extension on the bottom and the, the, the smoothness of a vocal. And things like reverb, yeah. and tails, and all that yeah. kind of business. Yeah. And there's, there's a space in, in songs that, that you don't hear with uh, digitally compressed files. And 96 is so superior to, to the way most music is recorded for right. these days, and even that was pale. Pale compared to the yeah, top. Yeah, the jump is exponential. You really, yeah. you really can tell and feel it, yeah. yeah. So the apathy, like I'm in the studio all the time, and work with people,
people and they're like, well, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter. Nobody's going to hear. They're just going to listen to an MP3. Yeah. Right. That's, yeah. Uh, that's yeah. out the window. That's now, we can, now we can, like, make it how we want this it to sound. This is like right. rescuing. Yeah, it's yeah. crucial. Yeah. It's an artist-driven movement yeah. to take it back. I'll drive. I couldn't drive this car. That's okay, but you can ride. <laughs> we had one of the great sound experiences of our life. I mean, it was just absolutely amazing. And you can feel, you know, what kind of an impact it can make in terms of really addressing so many of the problems that exist in today's record industry. Uh, the, the, the sound is absolutely amazing. And we were, you know, transformed by listening in this fashion. It's fabulous. Neil is so dedicated to doing this. I know what his mind is like <laughs> when he decides to go after something that is no stopping him. This is going to be a huge, huge breakthrough in terms of, you know, sound technology. And it's really exciting to be around. When a kid hears a song for the first time, you've got to remember, these are young people. They're, they're fresh. They're peaking. All their senses are there. Their vision is great. Their hearing is amazing. Their physical abilities are at their peak. Everything is tuned in, just like nature meant it to be. There's been very little damage. So just so I can sleep at night, I want to bring back Pono. I want to bring back real music. Pono means righteous. Pono is the one, the whole. It's a Hawaiian word. So I want everybody to hear music that way. That's why, you know, we're, we're on Kickstarter, so that we can share this with everyone. And everyone who loves music can share in the release of Pono and the launch of the real music experience in the 21st century. That's what we're here to do.